the head of we just start okay uh, ladies and gentlemen welcome to this seminar on um, the governance of and law in Russian business uh, with examples from the petroleum sector my name is Ole Gunnar Erstvik I am professor at BI the Norwegian business school Ponorsk called Hanse Skolen Bay and I'm also adjunct to Nupi at this institute. Uh, Transparency International has ranked uh, Russia as number 133 of 176 countries in the Corruption Perception Index. Um, and government contracts and purchases are identified as one of the uh, top areas of corruption. Uh, and also together with issues of permits and certificates and law enforcement uh, agencies. <clears throat> and according to various uh, estimates, the shadow economy represents some 77 to 25 percent of the overall economy. So this is a huge issue. issue. Who are the real decision makers in the economy? And is staying at the right side of the law possible? in uh, doing business in Russia. We have got the best guy on the issue to talk about it today, Mr. Mikhail Krutikin. Uh, Mikhail Krutikin, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll focus on this issue. He is editor-in-chief of uh, the Russian Energy Weekly, a newsletter that some of you may know uh, already, and an analyst and consultant on oil and gas industry and politics uh, in Russia and in the former Soviet the Soviet area, the former Soviet Union. Uh, and is also is, is the co-founder of Rus Energy uh, Independent Analytical and Consultant Energy. Back in Soviet times, <laughs> he was a TASS uh, correspondent from uh, being journalist and uh, um, and uh, chief of bureau in places like um, Moscow, Cairo, Damascus, Tehran, and Beirut, many ex exciting places in the world. Um, and um, he uh, speaks fluently Farsi, besides English, Russian, and other languages. And being historian, an expert in modern history, his PhD in modern history. So he will make a presentation of like uh, less than half an hour. Uh, afterwards, Mr. Bentley Hansen will make some remarks from his long experience with uh, Statoil and Norwegian engagements in, in Russia. And after that again, we will have the floor open for comments and uh, questions. So thank you, M M Mikhail. Can you really invest in Russia today? and operate your business staying on the right side of the law? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here. And you can call me Mikhail or Mikhail because my Norwegian grandson is Mikhail Philip, and so it's, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it because, uh, <laughs> because of the close connections between the two nations and uh, my, uh, within my family as well. Well, uh, uh, this presentation took me more than three hours yesterday to describe all the slides, and so I'm going to miss and to skip some of them, just to focus on the, some of the main points. And maybe I will focus uh, on some examples of uh, what to do and what not to do in Russia to be on the safe side. Well, basically, we uh, see very conflicted, conflicting uh, opinions about what's good in Russia, because our president uh, says that uh, foreign companies are attracted by the investment climate, and our prime minister says that the business climate is very bad. Uh, last week, I heard Mr. Putin saying that we still have a lot to learn how to do things. Well. That sounds uh, very encouraging, that maybe uh, it's not as good, but uh, maybe there sh some steps should be taken to improve the situation. That's an outsider's opinion, which is, uh, well, uh, I like it very much, 
Yes, you can do business if you are as big as Volkswagen, and we can replace Volkswagen with ExxonMobil or Statoil or Total or any. And uh, another condition, in if you are a friend of the Russian president. Well, it uh, shows two very important uh, points that I would like to focus on. First, it is the size of the business. Uh, in Russia, well, if you take a look at the current statistics, you would see that since the beginning of the year, about 400,000 small and medium-sized businesses just went out of business. They either closed down their shops and offices, or they became shadowy economy without paying any taxes and so on, because the environment in Russia does not benefit small businesses independent businesses and foreign businesses as well, if they want to act as uh, independents uh, without some Russian partners. And this is a very general tendency. Uh, when we hear the government headed by Mr. Medvedev saying that uh, the idea is to continue privatization in uh, the economy, and they have still some plans to continue privatization of Rosneft, for example, to sell some of the shares of the company. We take a look at what, what's going on. We see that, uh, in fact, uh, we can call it uh, creeping deprivatization. Because uh, we had uh, a big number of independent companies. And take a look at Rosneft. First, it, it took established control over one private company. It was Udmurtneft together with the Chinese. Uh, then they uh, got the assets of Yukos. Everybody heard about that. Then, then uh, they appropriated uh, TNKBP, another private company. Then they took over Itera, a gas company which was also independent. And uh, the uh, state-controlled company is this growing growing and growing and establishing a lot of control over the oil industry and has uh, some great plans to expand in the gas in the natural gas industry as well so we see that uh, in fact uh, there is some sort of a megalomania in russia growing very big they're very big entities instead of small ones and it i can say it is not good for the industry because uh, when you take a look at the new discoveries of oil and gas in Russia, they tend to be very small. It would take small companies, independent companies, venture uh, companies, to develop small fields, to risk. And uh, big ones just don't pay attention to those. Uh, well, some maybe 20 years ago, if you discovered a field with uh, 50 million tons of oil in it, it was just a regular um, happening. Right now, if you discover a field with 3 million tons, <clears throat> it's a great discovery in Russia. So that shows the scope of the problems the industry is going to face in the future. And the second <coughs> component of this equation is to be a friend of someone very important. This is what I'm going to say, that, <coughs> that it has replaced uh, something which we called roof or krisha in Russian. That was criminal protection. Maybe some 15 years ago, some of the representatives of foreign companies said, no, we cannot work here. We close down our offices, such as uh, Marathon Oil did in Moscow, for example. They said, we, we cannot. We, we have been targets of extortion by organized mob. Now we do not see any organized mob, organized crime. And if you believe some liberal media in Russia, they would tell you that, in fact, uh, the extortion, the protection money uh, should go to government officials, fire inspector, health uh, sanitary services, uh, tax collectors, and so on, and local uh, bureaucrats, and uh, license uh, issuing organizations, and so on and so forth. In fact, some people say that that's some sort of... Uh, well, symbiosis between the Russian governmental organizations and uh, specific people, and people who extort money from uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so, yes, there is some sort of protection, but if uh, it means going to the very high quarters in the Russian uh, government, it means that it depends on the size of your business. If you are big, you go and seek protection from above. 
and uh, uh, sometimes uh, well companies do get this protection I spoke to an American uh, uh, CEO of a very big energy company and he told me you know when I go to Moscow I speak to Mr. Putin or Mr. Sechin they do not promise a lot but if they promise they keep their word I know that they will do what they promised if I go to Kiev in Ukraine and if president prime minister ministers or whoever makes any promises and they make a lot of promises I must know that nothing will happen absolutely at all it's an absolute mess so if you have some law and order maybe it's good if you know that there are only two big companies in Russia that are really well uh, that really have some power to do something with a foreign partner that's Gazprom and Rosneft in fact then it's it makes uh, affairs very simple for you well uh, besides the size is not all uh, everything. The experience of BP, which was, uh, well, uh, driven out of some business. The experience of Shell that had to sell the control and interest in Sakhalin 2 to Gazprom shows that sometimes very big companies can also be victimized when uh, some important Russian people wants, want their business. It's uh, Rosneft or Gazprom or whoever. So there are no guarantees, even if you are big and if you, even if you are BP. And I can tell you that uh, the two most loyal companies to the Russian government in the oil and gas sector were Shell and BP. And both companies became victims of takeovers. And the most unloyal company in the business is uh, ExxonMobil. It has not obeyed any orders of the Russian government and it stays in business and it expands its business with the Rosneft. So it doesn't mean that uh, you must be very loyal to, to remain in the business. It, it, uh, it's different for each of the cases. So basically, well, that's a general impression of the Russians. I will not dwell on that. And what's really wrong with the Russian investment climate? Well, some people say it's discriminatory legislation in favor of state companies. Yes, it is. It's a pity when the Russian companies, such as Gazprom, demand special treatment in Europe. For example, Gazprom says, you should treat our pipelines in Europe as continuations of our domestic pipelines, it's, and we demand monopoly rights for those pipelines. But unfortunately, uh, it is not reciprocal. Because foreign companies in Russia cannot enjoy any spe special rights at all. They are discriminated. The laws of 2008 ban foreign companies uh, from the continental shelf, exactly. They can be uh, partners in special purpose companies, operating companies, just as Statoil was a partner in a special company to develop uh, Stockman. And uh, the, those companies do not have the right to post any reserves or to uh, claim any share of production legitimately to put it on their balance sheets to increase their capitalization. In fact, they are service companies. It boils down to a very simple fact. Onshore, if you are a state-controlled company, you cannot get more than 5% in a um, strategically important uh, project. And strategically important means that uh, if you discover more than 70 million tons of oil on your license or 50 billion cubic meters of gas on your license, by law, the government will take it away from you to pass it over to a state-controlled company and maybe they could give you a minority stake in the new joint venture and some compensation for the exploration costs. That's it. It's, if it is not discrimination, what, what is that? Then, uh, well, administrative hurdles are just like uh, everywhere. A poor competence of Russian managers and decision makers. In very many cases, there are good specialists, good experts. But if you take a look at some cases, you see that appointments at state companies, not private companies, such as Luke Oil or, for example, Bashneft, but uh, state companies, Rosneft, Gazprom, you see some very strange things. Uh, well, I promised some examples. At Gazprom, we have Gazflot 
a unit of the company that uh, uh, is charged with offshore operations, seismic and drilling and uh, uh, transportation. They have 300 uh, vessels. Uh, and the boss of the company uh, has been appointed uh, just two years now. His uh, experience was uh, officer for public relations at the Moscow unit of uh, FSB, the successor of KGB. Well, he doesn't know anything about gas, doesn't know anything about fleet. Uh, he's the boss of gas float. Okay, and so I, I can, uh, you remember, until recently, for very many years, the licensing business, mineral licensing business in Russia, was entrusted to a guy whose profession was a veterinarian. He was a very good friend of our president, but still he, he was not in the geology or licensing business, but he remained there quite comfortably. Well, uh, corruption, well, I don't know what you call corruption. It's, uh, well, the time has passed when you just uh, obtained uh, some, something for a bribe. Uh, yes, I remember in the second half of the 90s, uh, I was in a, well, I myself, we did some job for a government office. I came to the office and uh, we were to pay, those were wild times. Uh, we were to pay cash in dollars and the guy, uh, just produced an envelope with some American banknotes in it, uh, opened the envelope, took about one third of that, put it in his pockets, uh, gave me the rest and said, you understand. So uh, those were very wild times. Now they do not do it like that. Some clients came to my office and said, oh, you know, we want a very big um, um, uh, contract for the future LNG from the third train, LNG train on Sakhalin 2. Now that Gazprom is in control of the project and they are thinking about the third train, not quite sure, but thinking, well, we want all the gas, all the LNG from that train for our, for our East uh, Asian country. And he wanted us to help them establish friendly relations with Gazprom decision makers. He was prepared to take them on recreation tours in Asia and anywhere and uh, just and I asked him, do you want friends or do you want the contract? Because if you want friends, I can bring you a lot of people from Gazprom tomorrow <laughs> and please take them to the, wherever to Thailand or Hainan Island to. Uh, he said, no, I want a contract. And then I said, such contracts, the decisions should be made in the office of Mr. Putin and the Kremlin. They're too big. And you cannot bribe Mr. Putin, because the guys around our president have more money than you can imagine. They have accumulated so much cash that they can buy your country three times over. You cannot bribe those people. If you want something to, um, well, yes, you can get what you want, but you must un uh, identify the motivation of the decision makers around Mr. Putin. Uh, for example, if you bring them uh, interest stakes in respectable international companies, that their companies, Rosneft or some, or Gazprom, or, or maybe some of their relatives can become shareholders of respectable companies, uh, yes, then they will pay for those equity stakes, triple the price. They will give you the bribe, and you will get the contract. I don't know if you call this corruption or not, but that's quite another way of uh, thinking and another way of doing things. Basically, if uh, we uh, speak about corruption, well, it is nepotism when they install some sort of rel relatives in the important position. Sometimes it means that they distribute, uh, well, contracts to friendly uh, companies, such, and we witness it very uh, often in, on very many occasions in Russia, and we see that the budgets of such uh, contracts could be, well, again, double or triple the budgets of similar contracts somewhere in Europe, uh, such as Gazprom pipelines. Uh, the average kilometer is worth about triple the average kilometer in similar conditions in Europe, and so on. Then, uh, the most important thing is the deficiency of legal protection and the perils of takeover. This is what we have to focus on. Because uh, when I ask foreign investors, our clients, what is the main uh, 
danger in Russia. They, maybe it is corruption. No, they say, take a look at other countries. We, we, we know a lot of countries that are as corrupt as Russia. What about the discriminatory legislation in favor of state companies? No, it takes uh, Saudi Arabia, for example. It's uh, the same thing. We, we can work. It is the danger of having your business taken away. And uh, it is impossible to use the Russian justice because the, the judges, well, uh, basically there is no justice at all. It is, they call it the telephone law. If some boss calls the judge and tells him what the verdict should be, that's, that finishes the matter. In some cases, with the Russian contractors, for example, Gazprom has a special letter from Mr. Miller, the CEO of Gazprom. Please, in the future contracts, insert the uh, clause for settling the conflicts that they should be settled in the court of arbitration of Gazprom. Forget about Stockholm, London, and <laughs> so that's not like that with the uh, international contractors. But still, uh, well, that's, uh, that's the problem with some people who are immune from uh, justice. And in Russia, it happens very frequently, unfortunately. Well, imperfect taxation, maybe, uh, well, uh, I will not dwell on that for the time being. We'll sk skip that. Well, this is what Russia, 133, no, this year it is, there is a progress. Now it's 127. We are improving the investment climate in Russia. So, so there are some sig good signals coming from Moscow. Uh, well, uh, I told you about the immunity of some of the people. And I can add that some, sometimes legal counseling may be insufficient. Uh, the example is uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky in Yukos. All his lawyers told him that everything was okay because it was within the law. There were some loopholes in the law that he was using. Forget it. He was arrested and he was put in prison and the company was dismembered. Forget about law. Uh, well, informal connections in the right places, yes, yes, they are a must. You must understand that. And sometimes when companies do not understand that, they suffer. And again, let me tell you <laughs> another story. Uh, it was some maybe 15 years ago. A team of Shell went to Western Siberia to negotiate some contract with the Russian uh, locals. And uh, one of our analysts was also with that team. And when he returned, we wrote a story. We published it. And we said the, the guys from Shell behaved in a very arrogant manner. They did not know how to behave with the Russian officials. They treated them like dirt. And then we immediately received a call from Shell asking what was the matter. We had to explain exactly what they did and how they behaved with the Russian officials. And then what Shell did, they removed those guys, they appointed new ones, and they hired a trainer to teach the guys how to <laughs> behave in Russia and what to do with the Russians, maybe to uh, drink vodka with them, to go to some bus with them, to get acquainted with the families and so on, and to be polite and maybe some important things are not. Yes, and then I'll uh, tell you about a very recent occasion. Unfortunately, it's, it's about uh, a European company. Uh, they send a couple of guys, engineers, to a platform and uh, the, there was a storm, and there was no supply of fresh, uh, well, eggs and yogurt and so on for a couple of days. And there was a scandal, because according to Kant contract, those uh, guys from a foreign companies demanded they should be served what they were supposed to get according to Kant contract, and the Russians didn't like that at all. They say, okay, three days later, they received their omelette and everything, but they said, no, we are not going to deal with this company at all. We'll deal with the competitors. And unfortunately, when we told it to the bosses in that company, that European company, they said, no, the engineers behaved quite right. Because it was the guys who couldn't negotiate some deals with the Moscow staff of both companies, they were wrong. They, did, they don't understand. So it takes some uh, well thinking about how to behave in Russia to be on the safe side. Uh, yes, and uh, 
Well, staying on the right side of law, if uh, you do not notice what your Russian partner is doing, it's very, uh, very rare occasion when you find the Russian partner, which is also above all suspicions. We do a lot of diligence for our clients, due diligence for clients, and very often we uh, advise them to stay away from some of the companies, saying that, well, uh, it's a great reputational risks because the bosses, the owners of the company have some history of crimes and even manslaughter and so on. Uh, after them, it's, it's, it could be detrimental to your reputation. And uh, sometimes I can tell you just maybe one big uh, deal which was absolutely uh, blameless. It is the two do joint ventures that the Japanese Jogmek company formed with Irkutsk Oil Company. We have never suspected the company of uh, the Russian partner of any well, suspicious deals, criminal deals. They have very good reputation. But to find such a partner, it's so difficult. Believe me. Well, government-run ventures are more corrupt. That's natural for many countries, not only Russia. Because in uh, private corporations, they care for profit or loss. In the government-run corporations, they say, well, losses, they will be covered out of the state budget. Because it's the usual formula, the nationalization of costs and privatization of profit. And the main idea of state companies in Russia is uh, not to steal anything. No, 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 that's, that's too simple. Because I can tell you about a guy who stayed for several years. He was a very famous, almost an oligarch in Russia in the early years after the demise of the Soviet Union. And he went to London on exile, then he was able to return. And he told his friends in Moscow, oh, I have thought about wonderful ways to make new money. And the guy told him, no, forget, you're out of uh, touch. We do not need methods to make money. Absolutely. We have enough money and the main idea is to control to sit in a position which controls the flow of money that goes by not to steal anything but to control this is what government officials and big corporations do they control they distribute contracts and the contracts go to some well friends and uh, uh, family members and so on and then they receive something maybe it's not tangible maybe something abroad or maybe in some other places some political influence or something but uh, it is not direct stealing it's difficult to steal <laughs> directly in Russia as in very many countries uh, well uh, I'll miss some of the well uh, Basically, I think this is a wrong cartoon because it shows that Mr. Putin can be manipulated with different groups of influence. At least two of the groups are wrong. For example, group of Medvedev, there is one group. Uh, it's vice versa. No Medvedev groups, the prime minister, liberals in his government can manipulate Mr. Putin. And then another one is group of Miller. Miller is the CEO of Gazprom. In fact, is no more than a postman that takes uh, orders from Mr. Putin and uh, delivers those uh, strategic decisions to his uh, management board and uh, delivers optimistic reports to Mr. Putin that Gazprom has uh, got another victory on the market and the prospects are very good and very bright and sometimes, unfortunately, our president uh, repeats that bullshit publicly, unfortunately. Oh, well, we can say that the specific attitude be begins at the top. Sometimes it's psychological. Sometimes it's historical. Well, actually, yes. Uh, uh, when you negotiate something with the Russians, they hate win-win solutions. It would mean that they are making some compromise. If they make a compromise, they are losers. This is a well, overwhelming... Uh, psychology. Yes, in private companies, I participated in some negotiations uh, in private corporates in companies such as Lukoil. I was on the American side of the negotiations. I enjoyed the way they were doing business because they were well trained. They used all the tricks, good cop, bad cop, interrupting the negotiations, uh, uh, delaying negotiations. And I enjoyed it. It was uh, more better than any theater. Uh, but, uh, well, 
basically, I think sometimes this insistence on the monopoly roles, uh, no win-win solutions, and uh, old-style uh, contracts, that's detrimental to the Russian economy. When we see Gazprom behaving not as a commercial, commercial company in Europe, but uh, as a political company, they actually sacrifice their cash in favor of some politicized projects just to punish Ukraine, for example. Because it would have been much cheaper to spend $4.5 billion to upgrade the Ukrainian transit pipeline system than first to build the North Stream at about $20 billion if you count in the cost of the domestic lines that lead to that. <clears throat> then the South Stream, which is going to cost with the domestic lines about $50 billion again. And then to lose the uh, Ukrainian market. It used to buy uh, almost 60 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia. Uh, this year they are going to buy 19. So uh, just uh, let us harm Russia, just show the Ukrainians that we are stronger than you are. I, I don't understand that logic. And uh, before going, uh, again, example. <coughs> uh, foreign corporations can exploit that political weakness of the Russian uh, decision makers. And the North Stream project, for example, is a very good lesson. Uh, uh, the idea was to punish Ukraine, to conjugate Ukraine, and to leave it without tra transit of Russian gas. South Stream, North Stream project. It's an excellent project for Germany and to, for some other European countries. Because in Germany, we now have a distribution hub for Russian gas without any intermediaries. All the companies that helped Gazprom to build the undersea portion of the pipeline get their reimbursement with profit. Because the financial agreement with Gazprom says that there is a ship or pay clause. And even though Gazprom is using only maybe half of the capacity of those two lines in the Baltic Sea, Gazprom pays for the tran for transit of the full capacity. And so it is reimbursement of uh, the foreigners' costs. Moreover, Gazprom is doing what is called cannibalism on the market. It sends the same commodity to the same market at two prices which means uh, some gas according to long-term contracts and some gas to the spot market to some subsidiaries and friends of Gazprom in Germany. And the positions of Gazprom are undermined this way or that way. Gazprom still pays a lot to Slovakia for transit of its gas, even though it has stopped using the pipeline across Slovakia because of the North Stream. So uh, wherever you look, you see that uh, Russia is losing and foreign investors are very comfortable and cozy. And we see that last month, Gazprom signed the same sort of uh, uh, financial agreement with the partners of the South Stream. And I think the experience will be repeated there as well. So, uh, let well, just for, for a couple of minutes, we see the challenges for the Russian oil and gas industry, and this is the way the Russia actually reacts. If we see in Europe shrinking demand, Russia plans production growth. Production does not grow, it does, it's just plans. If you see redundant pipeline capacity, they build more pipelines. Right now it's 250 billion cubic meters a year, the capacity of the Russian pipeline to Europe. They are building the South Stream. Even though last year it was 117 billion cubic meters, so more than half of the capacity was not used at all. They are building more pipelines. Well, shale gas revolution. Uh, take a look. It, uh, everybody says it's a Hollywood movie. It's, uh, there is no shale revolution. Uh, there was a glimpse of hope last November, last October, not this October, but last uh, the previous year. On the 23rd of October, Mr. Putin chaired a session of his presidential energy commission. And very suddenly he said, you know, there is shale revolution. There is very strong competition for LNG and we may, may miss it. And the demand is Europe is not growing as we hoped it would grow. But uh, he did not make the 
conclusions that she, he ought to have made and because two days later he called Mr. Miller and told him to accelerate the absolutely unnecessary politicized projects in the East, which are, I can describe the economy of those projects, such as developing the field in Yakutia, building a pipeline to China, developing the LNG project in Vladivostok, and developing the uh, Sakhalin 3 upstream project. And uh, all the four projects are not the best ones. Well, Sakhalin 3 is uh, some, something which could be accepted as economical. All the three other projects are absolutely non-economical. I have the calculations made by Gazprom planners proving that the uh, payback cannot, uh, well, on most of the projects, uh, on a payback on discounted net profit comes after 32 years. And in some of the scenarios, it's never, 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 never in official documents of Gazprom. But the orders are orders. The only thing that Gazprom can do is to ignore presidential orders. This year, they did nothing to carry out the plan of accelerating the Yakutian and pipeline project. They missed one year. And when uh, just one thing be before I give <laughs> the floor to uh, my friend from uh, former Statoil, I can uh, tell you that, uh, well, uh, too much political projects. If uh, all the projects that Mr. Putin told Gazprom to carry out are actually launched, Gazprom will have to double the investment program. And the company just doesn't have any money to do that. You know that a uh, month ago they increased by 40% their investment program for this year. The, the, the year is almost over. They are increasing it just to uh, justify the costs that they had during the year to finance the Olympic Games in Sochi and some football uh, teams and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's not a commercial company. Uh, you know, I really can go on forever, but I have received some signals that, <laughs> maybe, well, the stream and uh, Yes, you, you, you know, you can work in Russia. Identify an opportunity, it's not easy to find an opportunity. Real decision makers. Again, sorry, sorry, maybe I'll take two more minutes. Uh, there is a sample. A client comes to us and tells us, you know, uh, I need to form a joint venture to get a tender, to, to win the tender for Gazprom. He visited four departments of Gazprom and spoke to, to four heads of the departments and he got uh, guarantees, 100% guarantees that the tender would be his, the victory would be his, if he formed a joint venture with this specific company. He brought the list of four different companies with 100% guaranteed each uh, to our office and asked us well, well, what is the real situation. When we checked, we understood that uh, there were no guarantees at all. It was just some private business of those bosses of Gazprom departments. And uh, we selected uh, company number five, who was actually uh, who actually understood something in that technology on an, an inferior stage, but still they knew what they were talking about. And uh, the main thing was that the owners had very good relations with the close friend of Mr. Putin, and they got the tender. So uh, due diligence, identify your opportunities, monitor the situation. For some companies, we have been doing day-by-day -day monitoring of the situations because they want to win some very big tender for several years before they understand that they can go ahead. It takes a very uh, meticulous planning and monitoring of the situation. Not just you come and you sign a contract and you go away with a lot of money. No, it's not like that in Russia. Well, yes, ba basically there is still a lot of uh, slides to show, but uh, maybe I will answer some questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. I think you can encourage most companies to invest heavily in Russia now. <laughs> um, and you will have a chance to elaborate more after uh, Bengt's presentation. Just briefly to present Bengt a little bit more, uh, he is um, working now as a partner with Selmer. But uh, he, 
has also formally been engaged with the oil and gas business and politics for a whole professional life, I would say. Starting in, starting in the Ministry of uh, Petroleum and Energy and later in the Hydro and uh,